remember we're back in this part of the gym and it gets really, really bright. So don't forget that. Let me see, make sure this is, there we go. <clears throat> I was wondering if before I spoke, uh, before I looked at the word this morning, if, um, you know, I know it's kind of, kind of been a heavy morning uh, a little bit. But maybe someone just has a word of testimony or a word of encouragement for us that uh, you would like to share as we kind of uh, transition from the worship and music to the words. So I'm not going to tarry long, but if anyone has anything they'd like to share, now is your chance to, uh, uh, to do so. Is there anyone? Yes, sir, Brother Henry. All right. All right. Well, we're glad you're here also. All right. Anyone else? All right. Then if you would, open your Bibles to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 8. <clears throat> so we look at just a, a story, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, but apply it to um, how we take advantage of the opportunities God puts in our paths, and so opportunity knocks. I heard years ago this old saying, and I think it's true, but years ago I heard this, that there are only two types of people in the world, those who make things happen, and then those who scratch their heads and wonder, well, what's happening? So which one are you, or which one should we be? Well, I think we need to be those who are trying to make a difference and to, and to, and to be those type of people who make things happen. And oftentimes the difference between success and failure is at one opportunity away. Or the difference between that is this person took advantage of the opportunity and another person did not take advantage of the opportunity. Here's some examples of people who have seized the opportunities that they had and it changed their life. Now most of these examples fall in the category of eventions and then the person becomes wealthy. So I don't want, you, I don't want us to confuse success with wealth but just the idea of people saw an opportunity and they took advantage of the opportunity. One guy by the name of Leo Gertzenzong, I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, but I know I got the first name right, Leo. But Leo thought of and invented the Q-tip when he saw his wife trying to clean their baby's ears with a toothpick and a piece of cotton. And the rest is history. He took advantage of an opportunity. Otto Diffenbach, that's another strange last name. So I guess you have to have a strange last name in order to take advantage of things. But Otto came up with the drinking straw when he twisted the wrapper from a cigarette package and saw that he had created a tube. And then of course the rest is history. Ali Evanrude got angry when the ice cream in his rowboat melted before he could get to his favorite island spot out in the middle of the lake. And so he invented the outboard motor, the Evinrude motor. So people take advantage of opportunities and they become quite successful. I'm, have you ever seen something on television and you thought to yourself, I wish I'd have thought of that. Or maybe you had thought of it, but you didn't carry through with it. For example, for years, I've been saying this for years, I would go to McDonald's or go to a fast food restaurant and and get it through the drive through and they'd ask if you want any ketchup and they would give you the ketchup in those packages and I would think, <clears throat> I can't tear the package up and eat the ketchup while I'm driving. Why don't they put ketchup in those little containers like they do barbecue sauce and chicken nugget sauce and all of that? I mean, that would be a great idea if they would do that. Somebody needs to do that and instead of me doing it, Heinz did it and sold it to Chick-fil-A and now you, all, you see those things everywhere and every time I see that I think that was my idea but I kept it to myself and of course today with the situations that are going on all around us not just yesterday but just all the situations there are opportunities around us everywhere to be the church and to be the people who God has called us to be but how does this apply to our lives, this taking advantage of the opportunities? <clears throat> Misty told me when I went camping, I would come back with a cold. And she's a prophetess. Well, we've been left here for a purpose. And I, I try to emphasize that every week. 
We're here to serve. We have a purpose. We are the body of Christ. And we, I think we emphasize that almost every week. To be the body of Christ means that we are Christ representatives on the earth today. We are his representatives, which means that we are to be doing what Jesus did. Well, what did Jesus do? Well, among other things, Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, if you want to turn there. Luke chapter 4 tells us what the ministry and the mission of the Messiah of Jesus would be. And thus what our ministry and mission should be. Jesus said, <clears throat> quoting from Isaiah, I have been anointed to preach good news to the poor, to release the captive, to heal the brokenhearted, to heal the sick, to release the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, the now and the not yet of the kingdom. And that's what we're to be doing, preaching the gospel to the poor, visiting the sick, visiting the prisoner. And, and again, Matthew 25, he tells us that, the difference between the sheep and the goats. And that's what we are to be doing. That's his mission and that's our mission as well. And so the people and the circumstances that come your way on a daily basis are not there by chance. Things don't happen by accident. But rather they are opportunities that God has given you to serve him. They are opportunities to bring God's kingdom into reality. <clears throat> that difficult person at work. Who you have a hard time with is an opportunity to learn patience. <clears throat> I apologize, I get over this and I'll be fine. <clears throat> to learn patience, to, to, to really practice what it means to pray for your enemies. That new neighbor who every morning at 6 a.m. lets his dogs out and they bark and they wake you up. God's putting there for a reason. There's an opportunity there for something. That difficult situation you find yourself in. <clears throat> God is stretching your faith. He's teaching you what it means to follow him. These are opportunities. And so I want us to look at this story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch and talk about <clears throat> five principles that we got to have in our life in order to be used by God. Now, first some background on Philip. <clears throat> Acts chapter 6 verse 5 tells us that Philip was the first, one of the first deacons. And so <clears throat> he was a well-known person in the church. He was highly respected. He was a Greek Jew, which meant that he, among other things, he could speak Greek and also Hebrew. And so he had a good reputation in the community. He worked to tear down racial and ethnic barriers between Jews and Greeks. He was loved and well-respected. The Bible tells us that he was also an evangelist. And so before we look at the story, I'm gonna do something a little bit different and give you the main lesson first. And then we'll look at the story. And here's the main lesson. You will never know the eternal consequences of one act you do in the name of Jesus. Let me tell you a story. Let's see if you can follow this chain of events. Back in the 1800s in the United States, there was a Sunday school teacher by the name of Edward Kimball. Can't really see his picture, but uh, somebody get the light so you can see these pictures. Edward Kimball was determined to win his Sunday school class to Christ, <clears throat> but he had one particular teenager who was a troubled teenager who he just didn't seem to be able to reach. And this teenager, <clears throat> an older teenager, would fall asleep every Sunday in his class. 
<clears throat> but Kimball was undeterred. And so he set out and made a go. I'm going to reach that boy, that young man for Christ. And so Kimball decided that he would go one day to visit the young man, the older teenager, where he worked. And so he says his heart was pounding as he entered the shoe store where this young man worked. And he said, I put my hand on his shoulder. As I leaned over, I placed my foot upon a shoe box and I asked him to come to Christ. But Kimball left thinking that he had botched the job. However, later that day, that young man, Dwight L. Moody, gave his life to Christ. And he left the store that day a new person. And eventually, D.L. Moody became one of the most prominent evangelists in American history. But the story doesn't end there. On June 17, 1873, Moody arrived in Liverpool, England for a series of crusades. <clears throat> the meetings went poorly at first, but then the dam burst and blessings began flowing. While in England, Moody visited a Baptist chapel pastored by a scholarly man named F.B. Meyer. At first, Pastor Meyer did not think much of D.L. Moody because he was uneducated and he butchered the Queen's English when he spoke. But eventually, Meyer became transfixed by Moody's message and, and became transformed by his preaching. At Moody's invitation, Meyer toured America. And at Bible conferences, Meyer would challenge the crowd by saying this, if you are not willing to give up everything for Christ, are you willing to be made willing? That remark changed the life of a struggling young minister named J. Wilbur Chapman. Chapman proceeded to become a powerful traveling evangelist himself in the early 1900s. And eventually, Chapman recruited a converted professional baseball player by the name of Billy Sunday. And Billy Sunday was one of the first evangelists who could fill up stadiums for people to preach the gospel. And so under Chapman's eyes, Sunday became one of the most spectacular evangelists in American history. His campaign in Charlotte, North Carolina, produced a group of converts who continued praying for another such visitation of the Spirit. In 1934, that group of people invited the evangelist Mordecai Ham to conduct a citywide crusade. On October 8th, Ham was discouraged and he wrote a prayer on the stationery of his Charlotte hotel. And here's what he wrote. He said, Lord, give us Pentecost here. Pour out thy spirit tomorrow. His prayer was answered beyond his dreams when the next day a central high school student by the name of Billy Graham gave his heart to Jesus. It has been estimated that in his lifetime, Billy Graham has preached the gospel to 2.2 billion people. Billy Graham has shared the gospel with more people than anyone in history. And it all started with a Sunday school teacher who took advantage of an opportunity to share the gospel with a young man in his class who sold shoes 100 years earlier. You never know the eternal consequence of one act that you do in the name of Jesus. You can turn the lights back on. Jesus put it this way. Jesus said, anyone who gives a cup of cold water in my name will certainly not lose his reward. And so what are these five principles? Well, principle number one, if you want God to use you and you want to take advantage of the opportunities, you got to be busy. Look at Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8, verse 4. Those who had been scattered, scattered because of persecution. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Christ there. 
When the crowds heard Philip and saw the miraculous signs he did, they all paid close attention to what he said. With shrieks, evil spirits came out of many, and many paralytics and cripples were healed. So there was great joy in that city. And then verse 12, but when they believed Philip as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. You see, Philip was a deacon. He was an evangelist. He was busy already serving God. See, the simple truth is God calls people not in their idleness, but in their busyness. If your prayer is, Lord, show me what to do and I will do it, that prayer may never be answered. What Jesus says is, and what God says is, just get busy doing what you know to do and I will tell you what to do next. If you sit around and wait to do something for God, guess what? You will never do it. God calls people when they are busy. And you see that all throughout Scripture from Moses all the way to Philip. He calls people who are busy already doing something. You say, Kevin, I don't know what to do. Well, do something. Do something. It might be, you know what, I'm, I'm going to be a different person at work tomorrow. I'm going to do something for somebody else. But get busy doing something and then God will call you and he will show you the opportunities to continue on. Look at Acts chapter 8 verse 26. Now the angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Cadence, queen of the Ethiopians, <coughs> or Candace. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. And the spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. And so here's the second principle. If you want to be used by God, you got to listen to the Holy Spirit. Listen to the Holy Spirit. In that story, at the beginning and the end of that paragraph, it says the angel of the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord told Philip where to go and what to do. Philip was so in tune with God that he could hear when God spoke. The simple truth is when God speaks, we've got to listen. But how does God speak? Is it an audible voice? Well, sometimes, especially if you're really, really hard headed. <laughs> but God speaks through his word. He speaks through other people. There could be a Sunday, just as an example in church, that through the worship or through the word, you hear God or, or something pops in your mind and you think that God is telling you to do something. And somehow or another, from the church to the parking lot, you forget all about it. And it was God speaking. And so you have to learn to hear when God speaks. The bottom line is, in order to hear the Holy Spirit, you have to be connected to the Holy Spirit and to have a personal relationship with the Holy Spirit. Jesus made it clear that his sheep will hear his voice. If you have never heard the Spirit talk, it's not because he's not talking. We've got to cultivate that and learn to hear. You say, well, Kevin, how do you know? Well, you, it's, it's like experience. Sometimes you just know that you know that you know. And sometimes you hear what you think is the Spirit, but you condition yourself to obey anyway. And you step out there and it was wrong and you missed it. Don't worry about it. You'll get it next time. But the point is, God, I think this is what you're telling me to do. By faith, I'm going to go do it. And if I, it's not what I'm supposed to do, Lord, <laughs> stop it. But this, I'm headed in this direction because I think this is what you're telling me to do. You hear the Spirit. Then look what happens in verse 30. So Philip is traveling around being an evangelist. God tells him to go this particular road. While he's going, he sees an Ethiopian in a, in a chariot. You say, well, how do you know he was an Ethiopian? Well, because he was very, 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 very black. <laughs> you know, so they must be from Ethiopia. And God says, go near the chariot. And just so happened that the Ethiopian was reading from Isaiah. And look what happened in verse 30. 
Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. And then Philip asked just a very simple question. Do you understand what you're reading? Here's the principle. When God speaks, you obey. I mean, can you imagine Philip? He's just on his way and God says, now go up to that chariot. He, go, he goes up, which there's some people say there was something miraculous going on that he was able to run up beside the chariot, you know, catch up with it. Just so happened the guy's reading from Isaiah. Philip asked, do you understand that? Very simple question. But he heard God speak and he obeyed. And look what happens in verse 31. The, the Ethiopian said, how can I unless someone explains it to me? So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. The eunuch was reading this passage of scripture. He was like a sheep sled to the slaughter. And as a lamb before the shear is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. And the eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is this prophet talking about? Himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told the good news about Jesus. Here's the principle. In order to be used by God and take advantage of the opportunities, you've got to learn and grow in your faith. How else could Philip take a passage from Isaiah and explain everything about Jesus from that passage? Except that he knew, he had learned, he had grown in his faith and he knew what the Bible was talking about. And that was the prophetic utterance of the Messiah and the humiliation and the death that he would, that he would suffer. The story is told of a little boy who was in Sunday school one day. And the teacher said, what's brown has four legs, a furry tail, and collects nuts. And the little boy raised his hand and said, teacher, that sounds a whole lot like a squirrel, but I know the answer is Jesus. See, we should be able to turn any conversation into a conversation about Jesus. We should know the, what we believe and we should know what God has done for us and we should have enough knowledge of what the Bible talks about that at the very least we can say, you know what, I don't have any idea what that passage means, but let me tell you what John 3.16 means and then just go to something we know <laughs> and turn the conversation to our faith and about, but that only happens if you learn and you grow and you listen to God and you learn and you grow and you obey when he tells you to do something and you learn and you grow. And you will be amazed at how many times if you start a conversation with someone, they will be talking about things that you just talked about with somebody else. It's like God was preparing you beforehand for that conversation. And so you learn and you grow in your faith. And then look what happens in verse 36. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down to the water and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. So Philip explained the gospel. The Ethiopian asked Christ into his life and said, why can't I be baptized? There's some water. He baptized him and then disappeared. Here's the fifth principle. If you want to be used by God, you got to follow through on your commitments. Why shouldn't I be baptized? Philip, or the Ethiopian, had committed his life. Why shouldn't I be baptized? <clears throat> now, Philip could have said, well, 
You can't be baptized until you go through a series of classes. You got to come before the church. You got to do all this other stuff. Or it could have been like me at the camp out. We were hiking in the river and some of the boys were like, Pastor, will you baptize us? And I had to say, and this is horrible, but I had to say, uh, not without parental permission. You know, I, it's just the day we live in. You know, but let's talk about it. But, you know, I, get your parents' permission and I will, but no, I, well, we'll baptize each other. And then they start dunking each other. So I don't know if that took or not. I have no idea. But <clears throat> you see. But the Ethiopian made a commitment and then he followed through with the commitment. Philip had made a commitment and then he followed through with the commitment. You got to follow through with the commitments that you make. You see, serving God is a lifelong commitment. And so you can't quit. You just got to follow through. And even if you make mistakes, don't worry about it because God's grace is bigger than your mistakes. How can we take advantage of our opportunities? Be busy. Listen to the Holy Spirit. When God speaks, obey. Learn and grow in your faith. Follow through on your commitments. Now, why is this so important? Why is this story so important? Well, let me tell you another story. Similar to the story about Billy Graham. Philip left. The unit, we presume, went back to his home country. Where was his home country? Ethiopia, Northeast Africa. By taking advantage of the opportunity and sharing his faith with the Ethiopian eunuch, the gospel was introduced to a whole new continent. The Ethiopian eunuch, Northeast Africa. 350 some odd years later, a young man in North Africa, Northeast Africa, committed his life to Christ. His name is Augustine, St. Augustine, or as we say in the South, St. Augustine. Augustine gave his life to Christ and became the most important theologian outside the Bible in history. Why? Because Philip shared the gospel with the Ethiopian eunuch who went back to Africa. The gospel was in Africa. St. Augustine accepts Christ as his savior. St. Augustine was black. Isn't that interesting? White supremacy sometimes bases its stuff on the scripture. And the most important theologian in Western Christianity is a black guy named Augustine. And not just a black guy. If Stefan was here, I'd still say he's so black he's blue, like Stefan's nickname. That's Augustine. And so what I'm getting at is there are things that we believe and there are things that we know about Scripture and about God today that are based on Augustine because Philip told the Ethiopian about Christ. You see, you cannot imagine the eternal consequence when you do one small act in the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, remember, even if you give a cup of cold water in my name, I will not forget it. You see, there is no opportunity so small that it's not important. And there is no opportunity so big that God hasn't equipped us to walk in and take advantage of the opportunity that he has given us. Take advantage of it. Pray, Lord, show me the opportunity. Lord, show me what I need to do. It may be something small that you think is not even important, but the eternal difference that could make is beyond our imagination. And we may not know about it until way down the line. Take advantage of the opportunities God sends your way. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you for your word and how simple it can be. And Lord, help us to be like Philip, to be 
busy doing your work so that when we see other opportunities, you will guide us. And, and Lord, that's how we make a difference in our world. No small task goes unnoticed when it's done in your name. The eternal consequences of that small thing are beyond our imagination. But Lord, help us just to be faithful and to take advantage of the opportunities that you give us every day of our lives. And we'll give you the glory and the honor and the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would stand with me and let's say our prayer together. Whoops. Sorry about that. You know what song's coming next. There's a leak in this old building. Say this with me. As we leave this place of worship and fellowship, let us commit ourselves to love and serve God by loving and serving our neighbors. You're dismissed.